Um, we were doing a little wrap up of our three sessions this afternoon. Um, so we had for the breakout sessions, we had three hazard breakouts. The first was we had earthquake, heat and flood. There were differences between these three different kinds of hazards based upon their speed of onset. Um, organizations that are intermediaries and interaction of compounding of hazards. And there's a couple of things that stand out to me from these three breakouts. Of course, there's other things that differ between those hazards also, but that was just me summarizing. Um, the first thing I thought of was jargon, um, technical language versus plain language, scientists and experts using language that's meaningful to them, but may not be meaningful to the public. We heard that across all three breakouts. The second thing was determining what information people need for decision-making. Do they need maps? Does that improve their message understanding? Um, should we be focusing on impacts? Should we be pointing out people's vulnerabilities? What's going to help people to make decisions to take action? Uh, the third thing we heard across the breakouts was the need for partnerships and intermediaries uh, with community organizations, with public health, uh, with industry and private sector and technology. And then the fourth thing I heard was that there are new products and new technologies, such as heat risk, FIM, and even the earthquake early warning shake alert system. These tools are being created. They're also being assessed. And we're not just assuming that they're working because they are approved internally or by other experts, which I think is a, a good cheer on for, for organizations that are taking into consideration the public needs. All right, uh, there's there was so much great stuff. I'm on just a couple couple of key points. The things I heard uh, that I found fascinating. First one I, I liked, and I, I got I'm gonna, I'm going to use this one. We trust the forecasters, not the forecast. I thought that was fascinating because it, it tells you how non meteorologists are having to process the uncertainty and forecast. Uh, the second thing I, I really liked that I thought stood out was Drew's description of people don't get storm surge. Yet you use storm surge to communicate risk to the public. And he's saying, they don't get it, folks. I'm out there showing them how high the water is going to be with a pole. So again, as we talk about jargon, and this has come up again, uh, we tend to use terms. And I remember this with the Weather Service. When is a tropical cyclone no longer a tro uh, tropical cyclone? And we dealt with this in Sandy. And we went from having no hurricane warnings up because Sandy was not going to be a hurricane, yet more people drowned in storm surge from Sandy than other storms. So this, this tendency for precision, I've heard this several times, versus use plain English. I thought that was something that stood out. Tom's had an excellent point. I, don't th I, 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 I brought this up. I don't think people understand how much emergency managers are reluctant to activate warning systems when there's uncertainty. I call it being Mike shy, but look at everything from Maui to Paradise on. They weren't activating their warning systems. Uh, and could that have changed the outcome? And then Jim's presentation on, we're not just speaking to a monolith. We're speaking to neighborhoods. We're speaking to economic sectors. The one thing I, 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 I wanted to ask this question, we ran out of time, but I want to put it out there. Is, um, because of all the politics, how do we communicate to the undocumented? We're saying we need them to register with government. Like, you're going to register with government and trust government if you are risking deportation? So, again, I think there was a lot of richness to it. Um, but, again, I, I trust the forecasters, not the forecast, local emergency managers. People don't get storm surge. I got to get a poll out there and show them that this is what it means. You know, emergency managers were reluctant to pull the trigger and use warning systems when there's uncertainty and life is on the line and you would think it'd be like obvious. And again, going back to Jim's point, we're not dealing with one monolith. We're dealing with a community. There's different influencers there. You have to be able to communicate differently. So to me, I, I just thought those were really excellent points that came out of that. Okay. A few thoughts. Uh, start out with Archie's clothes, never easy. Emergency management, life and death, uh, reputation. So much is on the line uh, every day when they're being faced with those decisions. It, it seems like they they each talked about lessons learned from past events. So so 
Oh, that's good. I mean, obviously they are investing. How did what went wrong? What could we have done better in those? And they lose those. But the other thing that came across to me was they're incredibly prepared. You know, they they have all oh, they do their their desktop exercises where they know the details of the areas. They uh, Jeff was talking about the phase evacuations. How do we get it out so we minimize the congestion? All these things just take incredible effort and resources well ahead of any event that they're prepared. They know how to work. They know how many hours or days they need for a particular lead time. And they have it. It sounds like just, you know, the clockwork that they really need uh, to minimize the impacts as they go through that decision making process. The other thing it, it came across is they're, they're clearly, you know, just head down, heads down, focused, uh, resourceful. They, they don't have the luxury like, you know, some other areas, and I would never say like in academia where they get to wait a little bit longer, but, you know, they, they have to make a decision, right? They and, and so their head's down and they figure out resources. If they don't get that information, they still need to make a decision. So they figure out how to go through that process, I think, in a really, really remarkable way. A, a final thing that came through is they lean heavily on this really trusted relationship with NOAA and the National Weather Service. And there's so much benefit there. Not only, like Archie mentioned, the the personal call to his EOC from the Weather Service saying, look, we don't want you to catch you off guard. We're going up to a four, be prepared. That undoubtedly saved lives. And it got that information out there in a way that that it was this partnership that they leaned so heavily on. And the other thing that that does is it it does allow them some buffering or protection from this noise going on outside this this trusted communications channel you know media yeah they have their they have their motivation they play a critical role in that communications but they don't have to try to filter out what's marketing what's real they go to the weather service which is focused on that partnership and that communication so that was really important piece as well um uh, yeah, that's probably it real quick. Just, yeah, really, really remarkable roundtable in my mind. And the one thing I want to come back on Bob's roundtable that is mine, the people actually making the decision to order an evacuation, in most cases, are political leadership. who do either have the background or the training and rotate frequently. And so in many cases, you know, we talk about the emergency managers, we talk about the weather service, is you got to remember there's a factor in there the elected officials and how they respond to that information. And it, as you heard from Archie, it's not an easy decision to make. No, yeah. He's parish president. He's got to make these decisions. He could get, you know, this could be an election issue. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs>